and kind of go in here at the bottom. In the annals of FPS history, there's those classic shooters that you hear every man and his dog talking about with things like Doom, Duke Nukem 3D and Quake. But people often forget that there really was an abundance of other shooters that came out back then, both good and bad. One that I've always kind of thought sat in the middle was Rise of the Triad, developed by Apogee Software and the so-called developers of Incredible Power, and originally intended as a sequel to Wolfenstein 3D. Released way back in 1995, it had the unfortunate timing of coming out after Doom when it really would have benefited from coming out before it. And over time, it's become this odd cult classic that sits on the cusp of one of the FPS genre's biggest evolutions. And outside of a pretty crappy remake back in 2013, which we don't speak of, it really hasn't had as much of the limelight as some of its brethren have. Either way though, in the year of our lord, 2023, Night Dive Studios, the guys known for remastering countless games, have teamed up with New Blood Interactive, the publishers known for never finishing theirs, and released Rise of the Triad Ludicrous Edition. And if you've had a hankering to blow cultists to pieces with a bazooka or a magical baseball bat, well, then I've got good news for you. Gotcha. Now, I haven't actually talked about Rise of the Triad since my original review that I did way back in 2014, a video which is so bad that it's a bit of a wonder that YouTube hasn't deleted it yet for breaking their terms and services guidelines. So I'm going to be covering the new Ludicrous Edition as much as I am going to be talking about the base game itself. <laughs> And if you do want to pick up a copy of this game through goodoldgames.com, which I do recommend, you can even use my affiliate link in the description box to get a discount off the base price as well. That's awesome! Now where it matters most, this is still just really the original DOS game, only it now lets you play through the whole thing with a modern resolution and at high frame rates. The textures, sprite work and other visual elements though are mostly unchanged. But what's most impressive though is how this ludicrous edition contains all those various mission packs in one neat little package. Then everything is wrapped up in a neat little package! You've got the original shareware episode, you've got the full retail version, and then even Extreme Rise of the Triad which was the add-on released in 95. Plus even an all new episode titled The Hunt Continues which is 28 entirely new levels. It also adds back in some features that originally never made the cut, like female variants of some of the cultist enemies. Over here. <laughs> oh, oh. There's new music tracks added in as well, and even alternate heads-up display options too. There's also the multiplayer mode, but still no co-op, which I gotta say I find incredibly weird. I mean, I've always kind of thought this game has sold itself as having cooperative play. You look at the front cover and it's got those two characters standing back to back as if they're fighting side by side. All the intermission screen shows the entire hunt crew standing around talking, and even the loading screen show them all getting geared up, ready to go, and yet it's a game mode that still completely eludes us. Either way though, the Ludicrous Edition is easily the most complete way to play these original games if you don't want to be faffing around. And yeah, if you're someone playing it for the first time, it's a damn sight more accessible than some of the other options out there to try to run that original version. So yeah, I mean if that's all you're wondering, well then you can stop the video right now. Thanks for watching. But if you want to know more of what you're actually getting into, well then stick around. As for the game itself, well, the best way to describe it is that it's an interesting shooter. Let's start there. With the whole thing really being spearheaded by Apogee Software and former its software member Tom Hall, who'd worked on notable PC titles like Catacone 3D, Wolfenstein 3D, and Commander Keen. What little story there is here is about a special forces team called Hunt going to the mysterious island of a secret cult to stop their plans to destroy nearby Los Angeles. Yeah, not Los Angeles. You got five characters to choose from here with each of them having different stats like health and movement speed and one of them literally only existing to serve as a wordplay choke. Hey everybody, I pee freely. Regardless of who you choose though, the experience is more or less going to be the same. And once you start playing, it's really easy to see how this could have been a Wolfenstein 3D sequel. I mean, ignoring the fact that the game runs on a heavily modified Wolfenstein 3D engine, even just looking at the basic weapons being a pistol and an MP40 and then the enemy types being evolution of the Nazis. You got those basic enemies armed only with pistols that don't really pose that much of a threat, but then there's also guys armed with the MP40s, and then faster, more intelligent officers, which are all archetypes from Wolfenstein 3D. 
You got four episodes in total with seven or eight levels each, and then the final level ending in a boss fight, which is a format that Wolfenstein 3D really helped to pioneer, and something that every shooter that came after it more or less followed suit with. Plus, it just really feels like an evolution of the mechanics in that game as well. I mean, instead of enemies just walking towards you and tracking you through the levels, now they show off some pretty impressive tactics, and some of them even have in bazookas. Like, sometimes enemies might play dead until you walk right up on top of them. <laughs> Other times you'll see them fall to their knees and beg for mercy to then hop right back up and start shooting at you when your back is turned. And in fact, I still remember my dad walking in on me when I was playing this as a kid, and him being absolutely appalled at me when I shot one of those guys in the middle of him begging for his life. No, don't shoot! Please! <laughs> Good one. You got one enemy type that rolls around to avoid your attacks, and another one that can even catch you in a net. <laughs> Plus, it also might be one of the first shooters where enemies could throw grenades, with the inclusion of those bullet sponge enforcers. Yeah, and hearing them repeat those voice lines over and over when they do it is something that's going to get burned into your brain. In the third episode, you've got robots that look like the Daleks from Doctor Who if they were made out of rusty trash cans. And then later on in the final episode, you'll take on these spooky cultists who walk around and moan like zombies, firing off these really powerful projectiles. Plus, there's also just like a lot of first-time moments here with some of these mechanics in the enemy types, and there's some really early examples here of the genre evolving and really updating itself. I mean, not to shit on Doom, and yeah, Doom had its own impressive road gallery of enemies, but none of those enemies ever tried to play possum so they could ambush you, or catch you in a net predator style. There's definitely something charming there about how all the enemies are digitized versions of people who actually worked on the game at the time, which also adds a lot of character and just shows how these people had a really fun time working on it. Plus the concept of all these playable characters having different stats for health, speed and even accuracy was also pretty unique for the time as well, especially for a first person shooter. I mean, I think the only shooter I can remember that had player stats back then was probably Hexen. During certain levels, an area might get flooded with toxic gas, and wearing a gas mask to protect yourself even realistically limits your field of view. Shooting up the abundance of priest porridge with explosive weapons is also going to heat that stuff up, which lets it restore more health points than if you eat it cold. And that's a cool little feature, which I think even people who haven't ever played Rise of the Triad still know about. Along with the best one of all, the ludicrous jibs, where you kill an enemy so violently that you can even see their eyeball fly across the screen. <laughs> Plenty of games before Rise of the Triad had ludicrous jibs, if you think about it, but this one right here was the first game to put a name to it. And then of course you've got what might be some of the most bizarre power-ups in all of gaming. Like Shrooms Mode, which fucks up your vision so much that it makes it impossible to hit the side of a goddamn barn. Not even like it's a fun little distraction or a gimmick either, it's just an outright handicap that makes it pretty much impossible to hit anything whilst it's active. I mean, you may as well just stand in the corner of the room staring at the wall Blair Witch style until the whole thing runs out. There's Elasto Mode, which turns you into a human pile of rubber bands, causing you to violently bounce back and forth on every wall you touch. And this is also such a weird mechanic that I think someone was actually doing Shroom Mode in real life at the time when they thought it up. Then there's Literal God Mode, where you hover off the ground, firing off these homing energy blasts which vaporize multiple enemies, even having your player suitably yawning the entire time out of boredom from the complete lack of challenge. <laughs> And then, of course, the best power-up of all, dog mode. Heh, <laughs> dog mode, which is, I don't know, as it sounds. Get out of my way! <laughs> it also might have one of the best attacks in the entire game, where you charge up this horrific howl, jibbing everything in your near vicinity. <laughs> one of those rare times when the bark is actually worse than the bite. <laughs> The thing about Rise of the Triad's combat, though, is that for most of the time, it's really only as good as whatever explosive weapon you've managed to pick up. Compared to other shooters from the same time period where you had that roster of like a pistol, shotgun, chain gun, rocket launcher, and all that kind of stuff, in Rise of the Triad, you've only got that starting pistol, which is so crappy, and even becomes redundant 10 seconds later when you find a second one. 
and then you've got an MP40, and once you find that thing, the whole combat loop turns into a holding down the left mouse button simulator, because you'll spend most of the time shooting at enemies with this gun and its infinite ammo pool. Holding it down for just a couple more seconds than it feels like you need to, because it seems like every enemy just has that little bit too many health points. With the absolute worst defender here being the Enforcer, that big armored dude that soaks up like a bazillion bullets before dying. I mean, to put it into perspective, right, the normal enemies on hard mode have 50 or so health points, right? The Enforcer on hard mode has closer to 500. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. I also find it kind of ironic that the in-game sprite for this guy is based off George Broussard, who was heavily involved in Duke Nukem Forever's development, and it's like, even in Rise of the Triad, this guy had no consideration for everyone else's time. There's no dedicated melee weapon or a shotgun, you've just got these three basic weapons. Which, if you think about it, is really only two, because the dual pistols is just the same gun used twice. He's right, you know. So when the combat is actually fun, is when you've got one of those many explosive weapons. And the other shame there too is you can only hold on to one of these at a time. Now the most basic one is the bazooka, which is more or less like a rocket launcher. Use the bazooka! It's got the highest ammo count, and it's just a decent all-around weapon, killing most enemies in a single hit. And being almost essential against those tougher variants like the enforcers and the robots. After that, there's the Heat Seeker, which is true to its namesake, seeking out heat like your mum seeks out young meat on a Friday night, veering off to home in on nearby enemies, but the catch there being that it does less damage than the bazooka. The other weapons, though, is where it does start to get a bit more creative. The Drunk Missile, for instance, launches out five heat-seeking missiles in random directions, which eventually correct themselves and hurtle towards nearby enemies as well. Definitely a novelty on the surface, but can actually be pretty useful if you manage to use that missile spread to your advantage. You've got the split missile, which fires out two missiles in a straight line, but then as soon as you let go of the left mouse button, the rockets veer off in alternate directions. Which really is just a bit of a gimmick though, and about as useful as fart flavoured breath mints. After that though, are my two absolute favourites. You've got the firebomb and the flame wall, which are easily two of the best weapons in the entire game. The firebomb launches out a single missile, which then explodes in a giant X pattern, and this thing just obliterates everything in its path, even literally shaking the screen around, which is an effect that I really never get tired of. And then the flame wall is probably the most specialized one out of the entire bunch, but also one of the most effective. Firing out a missile that ignites when it hits the ground, and then true to its namesake, sends out a firewall which pretty much kills all those standard enemies in a single hit. And there's nothing more fun here than lining up like half a dozen enemies at once, then hearing that comical sound effect as all their charred skeletons drop to the ground like keys on a xylophone. Amazing. And again, it just highlights the game's sense of humor, but also those genuine moments of creativity and really how they tried to think out of the box here with some of these weapons. Because truthfully, the last couple of weapons are a bit hit and miss. I mean, the Excalibat, for instance, is a magical baseball bat that can be either used to slowly bludgeon someone to death, or if you hold the attack button down for like five seconds, it sounds out this arc of explosive baseballs. Almost kind of like the quieter sword from Hexen. And yeah, look, it might sound good on paper, but the wind-up time is kind of useless in most scenarios, especially against the human enemies who waste no time in trying to turn you into Swiss cheese. On the other hand, you've got the Dark Staff, which is more or less like a delayed railgun, and this is also very similar, firing out this charged-up projectile that goes through multiple enemies. Excellent. All up, there are some great weapons here, but the fact you don't spend the entire time using them and often just have to kill enemies with the MP40 from the other side of the room, well, it does kind of stop the combat from being as ludicrous as it could have been. I think they saved that ludicrous aspect for the absolute bonkers level design and layout. And playing through Rise of the Triad really does feel like a bizarre fever dream at times, like you're caught inside this interactive MC Escher painting. Now, in typical old-school shooter fashion, Rise of the Triad is broken up between multiple episodes, with four episodes and then either seven or eight levels for each. 
The general gist is that you're working your way deeper and deeper into the island, coming up against increasingly challenging obstacles, and most of those obstacles are in the form of the often confusing level design. And like I said before, this really is an example of a game that came out during a time where shooters started to move away from that maze-like level design and started to create environments with memorable architecture and recognizable landmarks. That's why if you look at all the games that came out before or around Doom, like the Catacomb series, Blake Stone, Corridor 7, or the incredibly aptly named Ken's Labyrinth, you see level design which was clearly just designed to be obtuse and confusing. But then everything after that, like Heretic, System Shock, and Dark Forces, were aiming towards somewhat more sensible layouts. I mean, yeah, look, they were still confusing and obtuse, but it made you feel less like a rat in a series of random corridors hunting down a piece of cheese. Rise of the Triad definitely benefits from including an auto map, which makes getting around a lot less painful, but the long and short of it is that some of the levels in this game, regardless of which episode or mission you're playing through, are just completely nonsensical at times. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Levels feature things like jump pads, flame traps, lava pillars, and then there's floating platforms that move around these preset routes over and over. And it often outright turns the whole thing into a platformer. You ever played that old PS1 game called Jumping Flash? It was a launch title for the console where you played as a robotic bunny hopping from platform to platform in these bizarre, otherworldly environments. Yeah! that all floated in this void of empty space. And I know that Rise of the Triad beat that thing out by like a year, but that's what this has always kind of felt like to me. Almost like some kind of wacky Japanese game that's gotten lost in translation. Only this thing's made by a group of Texans. It's even got numerous collectibles around the levels in the form of those countless angst to pick up. And if you manage to find a hundred of these things, it even gives you an extra life, which also seems like a bit of a pointless mechanic in a game where quick saves are readily available. But something that's a pretty common feature in a lot of platformers. Then there's the absolute abundance of traps to avoid, like crushing pillars, spinning saw blades and spike walls, and about all that's missing is bottomless pits. <sighs> Instead of that though, it's got this weird feature where if you fall off the edge of the map, you get this weird effect, which I guess is supposed to simulate you falling to your death. Ugh. The entire premise of the game is that you're trying to infiltrate the cult and going through all of their temples and tenements, but all I can think is what sort of fucking lunatic designed this place, where every single room is full of lethal hazards. I mean, they've either designed it to have the single greatest defense mechanism against intruders, or these guys are more suicidal than the Jim Jones cult, and have basically no regard for their own self-preservation. What's even worse is when the level requires you to find touch plates to proceed. Specific tiles will often have a pressure plate on them which will shift nearby walls around and reveal the path ahead. And if you ever get stuck on an area for too long, well, you can bet your bottom dollar it's because you missed one of these things. And again, thank God for that automat. Until the fourth episode, none of the levels ever really feel like they're advancing in challenge either. One level might take you four to five minutes to beat, the next one will take you 15 or 20, and then the one after that's back to four or five again. The third episode by far has some of the absolute worst levels in the entire game. A lot of these ones are so barren and lifeless that it feels like you spend most of the time running around just trying to find keys. Just feels like I'm stuck on the Apogee software back rooms or something. Plus, that third episode also has the worst boss fight in the game with Enemy, which is a souped-up combat robot that has the most homing of homing missiles I think I've ever seen in a video game. I'm not kidding, man. The speed at which these things veer off and lock onto the player is just fucking staggering. The first two boss fights are against General Darian and Sebastian Christ. The latter who's basically Harvey Weinstein in a wheelchair. And these are pretty standard fare, just circle strafing around to avoid missiles and their explosive mines. And they're absolutely nothing when compared to the final few levels against El Oscuro, which are some of the most bizarre encounters of all time. I mean, ignoring just the weird and unsettling texture work and layouts, the first fight against this guy isn't even a real fight. You'd think you're supposed to shoot him based off, you know, every single boss fight in the history of gaming. So you go in there guns blazing and attacking with everything you've got, only to soon realize that you're doing jack shit. 
Because instead of that, what you're supposed to be doing is not attacking him at all. And then after a certain amount of time spent avoiding his attacks, he'll flee the area and you can proceed to the next stage. And how are you supposed to know that the first time you play through this is anyone's guess. In fact, that's actually the reason why I never beat this level as a kid. I pussied out and turned on god mode and gave myself all the weapons, and then I just sat there for what had to be hours, attacking this guy over and over, and could never figure out why he wouldn't die. <laughs> Man, you are one pathetic loser. The next level after that is called the Canyon Chase, where you chase him down this long, empty canyon, avoiding monks and fire pillars, then it almost feels like I should be behind the wheel of a car or something. And then for the final confrontation, he changes into absolute nightmare fuel, and you've got to take out all these giant disembodied floating heads before he finally dies. But wait! There's more. Only, yet again, the game is messing you around, and if you've just gone straight to this fight, well, then you're kind of fucked. Because scattered around the area are countless eggs which have to be destroyed first to get the proper ending. A lot of which are hidden behind locked doors, so, again, like, how are you supposed to know any of this for a first time playthrough? And you know what the one saving grace is through all of this? It is that you are privy to some pretty banging tunes along the way. Yeah man, one of the best things that this game has going for it, it ain't the weapons, the violence, or the level design, it's the soundtrack. Which is easily one of the best soundtracks from those old 90s shooters. Composed by Bobby Prince and Lee Jackson, whose respective works include games like Commander Keen, Doom, and eventually Shadow Warrior, Rise of the Triad has some really memorable tracks. And in fact, one of the few good things about that remake was hearing Andrew Holschultz's efforts in updating all of these. I think everyone knows Going Down the Fast Way, which is as iconic as At Doom's Gate from Doom or Grab Bag from Duke 3D. But I think the underrated masterpiece here is Havana Smooth, a song so catchy that most people don't listen to the lyrics, but they should. I mean, there's Cool, and then there's Havana Smooth Cool. There's even a comment on YouTube where Lee Jackson lists like 10 things that influenced him when he made this track. So it's more than just a random piece of music that the guy made for a video game. There's real thought and research that's gone into creating it, and it's the kind of thing that makes you jealous of people who had better MIDI cards back then. A lot of those old 90s shooters had fantastic soundtracks, and Rise of the Triad is no exception. A lot of those other things I said about Rise of the Triad, whilst they aren't necessarily bad, they are a product of their time. And at the end of the day, they do age the game a lot more than other shooters of the same era, which I think is an important takeaway. I've always felt like Rise of the Triad was the stepping stone for Apogee before they became 3D Realms and created Duke Nukem 3D, because it really is an early example of the kind of humor that became a lot more prevalent in the industry from that point on, especially with games that followed like Blood and Shadow Warrior. I want, I want, I want, I want. Should you still play and buy Rise of the Triad Ludicrous Edition? Yes, you should. Yes. Please. But is it the same timeless experience that a lot of other older shooters can often end up feeling like? No, it's not. Having said that though, the Ludicrous Edition is still the best way to play this 1995 cult classic. And I'll still happily shill for New Blood and Night Dive Studios until I've turned into worm food. Yes. And either way, it's still a hell of a lot better than that 2013 remake.